Okay, this takes us to topic two. We said we're going to talk about types of time-related costs and most commonly included in claims by the contractor. Can you walk us through that, yeah. please? Yeah. Well, there are various names can be given to the series of costs that can make up time-related costs, or TRCs as we call them. In respect of costs arising from employer risk events, ERES, it should firstly be made clear what is the difference between delay and disturbance. I personally consider that all overruns, uh, which are due to ERES, are disturbances. However, a delay is a disturbance that affects the, a critical activity or critical activities to the extent that the time for completion of the works must be extended. That overrun is termed an extension of time for completion or an EOT. Yep. We can use the term disturbance to describe an overrun that is confined within the programme of works. This is normally the case where there is sufficient float in an affluent activity that can absorb the extra time generated by the disturbance. You know, if an activity has got 20 days float and there's a disturbance that only lasts 15 days, then that should not become critical. Yeah, that's something that we call delay to progress, but it's not a critical delay or delay to completion. Yeah. There yeah. is a delay to progress to, to finish a particular activity, but does not impact the completion date. Yeah. Yeah, but as I say, we normally talk about delay and disturbance. So why don't we use the word disturbance just to be that non-critical mm -hmm. delay? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we can say that an extension of time is a disturbance that is also a delay, right? So an EOT is a delay. Notwithstanding the above difference in criticality, both forms of overruns can be can be priced uh, through comparable breakdown of costs. I can't think at the moment uh, if there's any difference between the breakdown, but irrespective of that, as, as is normal, damage must be proved by submission of any evidence to support it. So you'll find that costing a disturbance is virtually the same as costing a delay. Yep. Anyway, so let's turn to matters of costs associated with delay and disturbance. The, the first uh, differentiation we can make in these costs is using two headings, one for direct and the other for indirect costs. Direct costs are generally the more tangible costs that can com comprise costs of equipment, labour, excluding management and supervision, site establishment, site plant, rentals, often on the site, all of these type of uh, activities. All these costs can normally be found in the contract records, right? And here I'm going to bring up that old adage again about the three most important documents in any claim are records, 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 records. the three R. Yes. Records can be paper or electronic in a format and that can be directly assessed yeah. and, uh, is up, and they are applicable. <clears throat> now, equipment costs can be set out in a schedule as part of the contract. Attention needs to be given to variation in equi equipment costs as the contract proceeds. As the age of the equipment increases while the amortization decreases, I, I have in some instances seen claims where an item of plant or equipment at the start of the job is given uh, a value, a certain value, uh, and uh, three quarters of the way through the contract, that value would decrease due to amortization, and as such, the damage would be equivalent to the value at the time of the claim and not the value at the start of the contract. It's a very important item to make, especially with equipment. That, that equipment. has to do with yeah. some finesse in the claim to go in that level of details. Yeah, but it's not too difficult to do it. I have seen it uh, where contractors are quite willing and to do that, they will 
establish what is their actual damage on the basis of what their, the value of their assets are at the time that the, the uh, delay starts. As I said, it's a quite a complicated process, and but it should not be ignored. Yep. It should also be noted that most forms of contracts require the program of works to be resourced. That's all equipment, plant labour and the like identified and allocated to the various activities in the POW. It's amazing how often this requirement is conveniently ignored. The resourcing schedule can be used to cost equipment, etc., during periods of delay and disturbance. All at times it must be borne in mind that the time-related costs are damages, i.e. the actual cost that a party incurs. And that's why it, right? it's so important to link the period of uh, delay with actual loss. This is how you determine it, isn't it? It should be that. I mean, you're the specialist in programs of work. And how many times do you see a program of work in a contract that is not resourced? Most of the times. Yeah, exactly. And that is something that should be clamped down uh, upon. I know that one of the most successful claims that was processed while we were in Romania uh, was based upon the contractor actually do not source that resourcing in his program of works. A very attentive contractor. And it was amazing just how relatively easy it was to evaluate claims and actually get agreement. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It gives more well, it can visibility. Be done, you know. Yeah, it can be done. It, it gives more visibility and it's easier to persuade yeah. the employer and to prove that this was actual loss based on Yep. resources and the information available and shared with the employer. Totally agree. So therefore, care must therefore be taken when assessing stand-down costs of equipment. That's when a, a, a piece of equipment is standing because of the disturbance and can't be done. And it can't be operated to distinguish between actual loss and potential loss, such as we come from higher rates. Now, I use the analogy of putting your car in a garage, shutting the door, and saying, how much does it cost me to have my car in such a situation? Yeah. And you work through the actual costs. And that's the type of approach that should be made to costing equipment during stand-downs. This, the assessment of equipment costs can be complicated where a contractor has hired the equipment from a subcontract or service provider. In such instances, consideration needs to be given to whether or not the equipment should have not have been demobilized during the delay period. That means if I put a hired car in the garage, the cost of the hire doesn't change. Much better to return the car back to the hire company. Indirect costs are those that are not so readily evidenced, and as a result, they can easily generate disagreement over their assessment. They can comprise site office overheads, SOOH, head office overheads, HOOH, and profit. In some instances, the SOOH can be considered as a direct cost where their assessment is straightforward and it doesn't contain any hidden elements, and more importantly, their value can be amicably established. Yeah. Now, overlap can occur in some instances, such as site rental or insurance being included in site office overheads or in the head office or of overheads. Care must therefore be taken to avoid double counting. The term I like to use for indirect costs is unabsorbed costs. Like what do we mean by unabsorbed? Normal practice in the pricing of a tender sees the bidder completing a bill of quantities in which allowance is made for the indirect costs in each item. In the case of a rate for head office overheads, this can be established from previous accounts, identifying annual turnover and annual head office costs and taking the percentage of the latter divided by the former. Looking at a particular tender, the total allowance for head office overheads could be seen as a contract price times the head office overhead percentage. 
In the course of the contract performance, the head office costs would be paid or absorbed through a payment for each item of work completed. However, in the event of a contract running longer, then the contract period may well uh, have no work available to absorb the head office overheads. These lost costs would be termed unabsorbed. That's the, we covered that second question before we move on to the challenge in evaluating unabsorbed costs. Before we do yeah. that, can we highlight the main, the main difference between direct and indirect or unabsorbed costs? Direct costs are those strictly related to the work that is done on site. It's the equipment, it's the manpower, it's strictly related to the, to the work for that particular project. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I say. They're tangible. They're there. The records on site should show it. And there's access to those records and you should be able to assess what costs the contractor incurred. At for the time that particular question. project, but when we move to yeah. in, indirect or unabsorbed costs, and you talk about head office overheads, you're basically talking about the company or the contractor as an entity that has multiple projects and that has to spread across multiple projects the head office overheads. Yeah, and we said that things like insurance and bonds, etc., can be more tangible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and perhaps they can be separated as uh, as a separate cost. Yeah. Uh, and that would be as an in, as a direct cost that would be separated. So, so the but then is... then you get problems that by separating them from the head office overheads, have you actually separated it, or is there something still in the head office overheads that is part of those securities and bonds? In in topic three, the challenge or the challenges in evaluating unabsorbed costs we'll discuss um, how you can prove actual loss right yeah okay so how you can try and prove it <laughs> yeah